Gresham College presents Debussy, Text and Ideas Debussy and the Acton Vers by Professor Richard Langham Smith, Royal College of Music You should have either now or this evening uh, as an adjunct to the recital programme a translation of the complete text of Diane au Bois which I suggest you do follow through as last night turning the pages quietly uh, during the recital because you won't get very much out of the, uh, this quite long verse act as I would call it and not a cantata unless you do see exactly what's going on. You might need your reading specs for it. <clears throat> Amongst recent discoveries, recordings and publications trickling out have been several which may have caused us to reflect on the compositions of Debussy's youth and their importance as a wellspring of his later preoccupations. Not that we haven't known that for some time, but as the oeuvre complète reveal to us more and more, we are deepening our appreciation of the ways in which the early songs and other vocal works composed during what we might call the Vanier years grow into more mature works later on. I use the word the Vanier years deliberately to emphasize that I'm not casting the net just around the songs he composed for Madame Vanier herself. For at the same time, the letters Debussy wrote from Rome to her husband, Henri Vanier, give us an unparalleled and the most revealing picture of his artistic development, uh, quite apart from the attraction to Marie-Blanche Vanier, his wife, and to her agile and stratospheric soprano voice, and has a role as a muse for his setting of the single songs, not to mention her role as his sexual initiator. For this paper, I want to ignore the importance of those single songs, whose highlights for me are the setting of Malamé's Apparition, which we heard last night and we, which we will hear again tonight. And it was a song in some ways mature before its time. Nor the early settings of Verlaine, to which he would return more triumphantly later on, nor the extraordinary setting of flute, palm and sable, accompanied by piano and harp, whose wordless vocalese seem to foreshadow the style of the loosely underpinned decorative melismata that we often call his arabesques, a hallmark of his middle period works. In papers elsewhere, I have attempted to take further the groundwork carried out by Edward Lockspeiser and Eileen Souffrin from around the time of the Debussy centenary in 1962, when these two figures first explored the relationship between the text of Théodore de Bonville's so-called cantata, Diane au Bois, and the all-important poem on which Debussy based his Prélude à l'après-midi d'un faune. Taking their work as a departure point, my approach has been to emphasise the all-important fashion for the act en vers the dramatic verse act, and to stress the importance of the first version of Mallarmé's phone poem, which was in essence deliberately crafted as an act en vers and sent to Bonville as a tribute. It was originally entitled Improvisation d'un phone, and although many of its features were retained in the final version, in this first version, it was essentially a dramatic poem with stage directions. The importance of the literary myths cannot be overemphasized. In Diane au Bois, the central theme is of Eros seducing Diana by playing her the flute. And in Mallarmé's developing phone poem, a similar trion to a couple of nymphs is achieved not only by his playing, by, but also by his carefully fashioning of the flute from the reeds he has chopped down known as phone hacking, and by his adjustment of the flute. The French word is ajuster, and it can mean both to adjust and to tune it. The idea is perhaps that he uses human endeavor in the service of his desire to seduce the nymphs. 
If you like, he engages his human brain of his upper half to ensure the gratification of his animal lower regions. Looking further into this comparison, I've suggested that the deepening of the theme of music over the three versions of Mallarmé's poem to, to the point where a somewhat clumsy rhyme using the word hola is replaced with a line about the perfection of the instrument where the player, the faune, searches for the perfect A, for the le, la. Mallarmé's replacement line is trop d'hymen de qui cherche le la. The idea of searching for the A, the tuning note, the diapason, the final, the fundamental note of the Aeolian mode, I think, is crucial to Debussy's subtle complexion of the pre uh, conception of the prelude, perhaps explaining his de deliberate choice of the problematic flute note, C sharp, as a long held note, perhaps a tuning note, throughout the first section of the prelude. This unfingered note being the open uh, note of the modern flute, the challenge being for the player or for the faun to find a seductive tone for this ever so difficult to play note with a tone decent, um, decent enough to cause the nymphs to remove the veils they wear as protective undergarments, according to one Caledonian musicologist who left shortly ago, uh, their barricade mysterieuse. Thoughts along these lines have been fertilised by the perceptive comments of Debussy scholars at recent conferences, notably François de Médicis, who also perce perceived a search for a real A in the flute meanderings in the first section of Debussy's prelude. Indeed, this note is largely avoided in the flute part before bar 23, where the, bar, where the note A is suddenly highlighted as a crucial extended note marking a new departure. This is how, I think, the subtleties between the text of the prelude uh, uh, of the poem of Mallarmé, the, the um, La Prémédie d'un Faune, uh, affect Debussy, not in a way which is in, in, in a narrative way in which the, every bar or every section uh, follows each, no, uh, each section of the poem. And uh, also th thought provoking in the recent conferences were the musing, muses, uh, musings of Marc Devoto whose recent paper at Montreal was very persuasive in identifying the special significance of the note E for Debussy, along with its attendant key signature of four sharps. And I noted it once again this morning in, in Joseph's paper about uh, Eventail, uh, that that E was the landing note, the note at the absolute uh, climax of the poem. It, it's very, very prominent in Pelias and Melisande, where it's associated with the character of Arkel, who some people think is a silly old, um, a Pelias with grey hair, Boulez brought in, but Boulez wrote rubbish about Pelias. And, um, but it, it comes when Arkel, for the first time, says, can we ever see the underside of fate? And that note is that note E underpins, almost like pressing the underlying button uh, under that phrase as the music slows. And I found that Mark gave us a lot of examples, and since uh, I, I, you seem to find a lot more, this note E was sometimes somehow very important for uh, Debussy. Its key signature, the key signature of four sharps, the E major or whatever it is, is shared both by Diane Le Bois and by the Prelude à l'après-midi d'un faune, and is an, in, an important structural force in both pieces in the sense that it is subverted at first before it is established later. For the moment, however, let's not stray too far towards the music. For there is a little more to be said about the way in which study of the literature Debussy read, and in some cases the plays he saw, can illuminate our understanding of his musical processes. Equally important is the question of the Bonville that Debussy read. Raymond Bonheur confirms to us that Bonville was an early literary enthusiasm of Debussy, having first found him reading a copy of Bonville's work, poetry or plays, when he first met him at the Conservatoire as early as 1878. Uh, Debussy's interest in Bonville 
thus predated his in association with the Vanier family. However important they may have been in this family in developing the composer's literary knowledge. And while the several settings of Bonville's smaller poems are inextricably linked to Madame Vanier's vocal strengths, his setting of Diane au Bois is not. It has a high tessitura, but not the coloratura of the early songs, and it demands real drama. Dare I pronounce the name of Richard Wagner? In two letters from the time of its conception, he reveals ideas about his conception of Bonville's Acte en Vert and his attraction to it. The first was to Monsieur Vanier, dating from June 80, 1885, when Debussy was 22. The reason, he writes, I've decided to set Diane is that it's nothing like the usual texts people send back from Rome. I always want something where, in some way, the action will be subservient to a deeply explored expression of the sentiments of the soul, so that the music is more human, more real. The passage, I'll read it in, in my um, exotic French accent. Uh, J'aimerais toujours mieux une chose où, en quelque sorte, l'action sera sacrifiée à l'expression longuement poursuivie des sentiments de l'âme. Il me semble que là, la musique peut se faire plus humaine, plus vécue, que l'on peut, peut se faire plus humaine, plus vécue. Oui, I've written it twice. We can draw three points out of this all-important quotation. First of all, that Debussy is definitely thinking of a dramatic piece. And from this point of view, the nature of Diane as an act en vert was clearly in his mind. Secondly, he was interested in a, in a subject where changing feelings were his challenge. The sentiment, the sentiment d'âme. And third, there is the question not of portraying but of representing reality, of finding a lived-in music, la musique plus vécue. In other words, Eros and Diane are real dramatic characters in what is more a dramatic scena than a cantata. This idea is expanded upon in a letter to Claudius Poplin in December of the same year, Poplin being the father of one of his colleagues at the Villa Medicis in Rome. In form, Debussy writes, and in its means of expression, Diane has no antecedents. I think he's talking about musical models here. Quotation, I want to find music that clothes the poetry in some way to give the sensation of living it and not to end up in the conventional theatrical way that music so often does. Again, he uses the word vécu, lived through. Posh musicologists drawn to literary theory use the word diegetic for these moments of music within the music. It's difficult to deduce from the surviving music for Diane whether the two scenes from Act Two, which he set, were all that he intended to set. I'm pretty convinced that they were, and that essentially his piece was a musical setting of an act en vers. As Debussy explained, the envoi, that's the thing, the, the, the assignments, I think we'd call them, that he had to send back to Paris from his séjour on, in Rome, were meant to be in the form of cantatas. So these scenes, together lasting almost half an hour, would be quite a substantial submission. He calls the part of Bonville's act en vers he sets a comédie héroïque, not a term exactly used by the poem himself, it's himself, by the poet himself, though the piece is in his collection of comédie. While it's not inappropriate for the scene Debussy sets, the comédie héroïque label, essentially the denouement, it's essentially the denouement of the play where Eros successfully seduces Diane. The rest of the play is really much too light and silly to be heroic. On the contrary, it is sometimes humorous in tone. It's essentially concerned with a pair of forms 
who attempt to seduce a pair of nymphs with contrasting degrees of success. The, the curtain opens on Nifon, a satyr who constantly swigs from his wineskin with the aim, as it is, uh, says clearly in the stage direction, of getting completely and utterly drunk. Nifon has no success with two of Diana's nymphs, and as a result spends a lot of his time consoling himself by weeping into a fountain. Eros, by contrast, is irresistible to the nymphs, especially, it seems, because of his blonde, the blonde hair which covers his whole body. Uh, nymphs apparently go for that. Uh, the uh, similarity of the plot to Malame's L'Après-Midi have been explored to some extent, as have the similarities between the music for Diane and for Debussy's Prelude, but I want to suggest a few strategies we can see Debussy uh, developing. First of all, we need to remind ourselves of the nature of Banville's Act en Vert. Crucial to its setting is the idea of the populated landscape in which music seems omnipresent. And essentially, Debussy complements whatever scenery is on stage or in the imagination with a soundscape. I hope you'll listen out for these points when we hear uh, the concert this evening. Not only do all the characters in Bonneville's play carry instruments, but the music is essential to Bonneville's concept of his act en vert as a reworking of the idea of the Greek ode, in which song and flute playing to the accompaniment of lyres was central. In his preface to the 1879 reprint of his comedies, including Diane, Bonville explains how his aim in these short plays was to imitate the Greek odes in which music was perpetually present, particularly the lyre. The, he writes the lyre, um, uh, uh, yes, and in the play itself, one of the characters remarks on the blend of the flute and the lyre as a duo rare et mélodieux. All of the characters in the play are identified not only by the instruments they uh, play, but also by the refinement of these instruments. The two fauns, Nifon and Eros, are distinguished by the flutes they play. Nifon has a flute hanging round his neck, but when Eros seduces Diana in the section the Busy sets, he plays a special magic flute belonging to the demigod Silene, Silenius, a flute renowned for its catalogue of successful seductions. In fact, this is crucial to the drama, since in the very first lines of the play, Nifon confesses to stealing this flute from the drunken Silène, along with his outre, his wineskin. He has stolen both his passports to pleasure. Maybe he'll get lucky, but he doesn't. At the end of the first scene, he's so drunk that he falls asleep on the grass and Eros mischievously ties him up with a briar rose branch whose spines will surely wake him up when he turns over. When he does, Eros laughingly calls him a naughty satyr, méchant satyr. By the time he's woken up, Eros has hidden behind a rock. And Nephi is so drunk and confused when he sees Eros, he bursts into tears. How very silly. And how delightful because all these capers are, of course, described in perfect Alexandrines. And when some of Diana's nymphs start, to thinking, start beginning to think that breaking their vows of chastity might be rather nice, Diana tells them off very severely in perfect Alexandrines. I'm expecting a post-paper correction from the experts on this one. To return to the instruments, Diana and her nymphs, huntresses by trade, of course, all carry horns. And once again, Bonville emphasises the difference of Diana's horn, which is special in that it's made of ivory, and we imagine that the horns played by the rank-and-file nymphs of her army are made from lesser beasts, probably commoner garden goats uh, from their flocks, probably. It would be interesting to hear how these musical elements were portrayed in the original incidental music which accompanied the first performance of Bonville's play at the Théâtre de l'Audion in 1863. 
It was composed by a composer now forgotten, Joseph Ancessi, who was born in 1800 and made his name as a musical director at the Odeon Theatre from 1845 to 53 and made his career in non-operatic theatres. Although the few pieces of his I've looked at, I can't find the music for Thierne, confirm Poujin's estimation of his music to be sans valeur. I wouldn't mind seeing what he wrote for Diane. Whatever it was like, Debussy took his cue from the musical elements in Bonville's play and certainly made something of both Eros's seductive flute and the horns of Diane's nymphs. I, as I have suggested elsewhere, these elements were directly carried forward into Debussy's Prelude de la Primidie d'un Faune, where the faun's flute is not only echoed by the horn, but also has prominent lyres in the background, sometimes accompanying the flute in that delightful com co combination, quote, mentioned in the text of Diane Aubois, where the flute is accompanied by the lyre, that is, its modern orchestral substitute the harp. If you think of the beginning of the Prelude à l'Apremidie d'un Faune, you have what I think is the tuning notes. Do, 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 do. Could be a, could be a pan pipes. Do, 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 do. Six notes, which is the exact six, note, six notes of the pan pipes in the syrinx myth. I don't know. And then, after that flute melody, the faune, Diana's nymphs, or the nymphs around in the woods, echo with muted horns in the background, do 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 and then the lyre. And so that soundscape seems to me to be established right at the beginning of the Prelude à la Primidie de Faune. The idea of the populated landscape represented by a soundscape was certainly initiated in Diane au Bois and recurred in both his unpublished opera Rodrigue Chimène, not to mention his real opera Pelias. Diane begins with a landscape disappearing into the half light. You, if you read the, um, the, the programme for tonight's concert, you will see these stage directions which show you that the concept of the opening of the piece is this fading down of the light on the landscape. Night falls gradually and the landscape disappears little by little. On voit la nuit tomber à demi et le paysage s'effacer peu à peu. But what was this landscape? For a full description, we have to go back to the beginning of Bonville's play, where he describes a Parnassian glade, definitely woods not the dark romantic forest of German writers, which in turn perhaps were an inspiration for Matelink. Corot did these woods very nicely in a series of paintings stretching all the way through his life. There's one of the nymphs. That is actually Silen, Sinelius, the great seducer with his magic flute, with all these nymphs seeming to be rather attracted to him, even though he's described as a ruddy-faced uh, old geezer, really. <laughs> and that is the myth of Diana and Actaeon. See, the woods are not forests, really. They've all got glades. And, and that's... Orpheus with his lyre, very much highlighting the instrument against the light. And this is Bonville's description. A clearing with a carpet of grass, shady, this is for Diane Aubois. A clearing with a carpet of grass, shady places, streams, and a waterfall whose sound is occasionally heard. Note how Bonville even indicates the soundscape uh, in his stage direction. In the background, we see the slopes of Mount Olympus covered with snow. And how much this all contrasts with the forests of Pelias, where Genevieve describes the places where the sun never shines. 
Debussy's music to depict the landscape falling into darkness exists only in short score, or particelle we call it, that is a score without orchestral indications. But this, the tremolo at the beginning surely means we harps or tremolando strings. There's nothing else could play it. And what else could the high register motive be, pianissimo, other than a flute or piccolo? You see in the middle there those bars, that is the tremolando shorthand, probably for strings, possibly for harps. Uh, right in the second bar, high up, do 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 do. That couldn't be a clarinet, couldn't be an oboe, and it wouldn't be a string. It must surely be a flute or piccolo. So the soundscape has those two elements. And then at the end of the second um, system, at the top, you'll see those horns, da da da, da da da, da da. And then they come in in the second bar of the third system, echoing again, just two notes. Horns play two things. They either show you the, uh, a fanfare or a horn call, or they are a wonderful evocation of distance, especially when they're song, when they are sounded muted or played stopped and very quietly. So I think we can deduce, even from this sketch, this triple element of the landscape uh, being populated with the fawn and with the nymphs of Diana playing perhaps on another level in the distance. But he takes another um, element too, uh, and I think he retains these two elements uh, forward into the prelude that I've already evoked for you, and that is this idea of the lyre, which, which must be there somewhere in the uh, orchestration. In theatrical terms, the concept of the sound, uh, soundscape suggested by the musical dialogues in Bonville's Act in Act en Vert is plundering a particularly French theatrical technique which goes back probably further than the 17th century and emerged triumphantly in Bizet's Carmen, incidentally, a piece Debussy adored and could sing from memory, and would emerge later in both his unfinished opera Rodrigue and Chimene and in his triumphant opera Pelias. This is the technique of the coulisses, the wings, the backstage unseen, where things happen and we, where we know things are happening, but we don't see them. The changing of the guard in Carmen or the bullfight. In Pelias, the ship which sails by and we hear the hisoes or we, we hear talk of the beacons out to sea, which are described as an unseen um, element, but something that we cannot see in the staging. And, oh, I learned yesterday also that that bell is, is on stage, the bell at the end of, uh, of Peleas from, from uh, Catherine's paper. So this background other is already crucial to the soundscape with the distance of the woods portrayed by the horns uh, responding to the flutes. Together with Eros playing the twice-borrowed magic flute to seduce Diane, we have certainly an element which accords with Debussy's desire to make a music plus vécu, this background of unseen distance horns deepening the landscape music element. flutes that's just before the voice comes in and it must be landscape music but there's something Debussy does in this which subverts the key because we have most of most notably just the bare fifth of the C sharp and G sharp 
The horns just about sort of make it a major, uh, but only just, and then we return to just the bare fifth on the third system. But then what happens? element, the shimmering, actually uh, dovetails these two sections for the voice to come in. And if you look at your uh, uh, scripts, I'm not going to read it out now, but tonight the, the, you'll see that in fact the link between the singer, Eros, he is invoking the landscape. Uh, and before he starts uh, with the dramatic action and with D Diane's eventual absolute uh, personification of this idea of the changing sentiments of the soul because in one bar she's, she is drawn to him and then the next one she remembers her vows of chastity. Uh, before all that we have the invocation of the landscape. So Debussy's, Debussy's challenge is to modulate away from the, from the landscape music into something which is more uh, expressive of the sentiments of the soul. The masking of this um, tonality established at the beginning, I mean, I find it very fine in this. It's, it's a beautiful thing when that chord actually comes in. Uh, it's, a, it's a technique which is followed up in the Prelude de l'Aprimide d'un Fon, where at the beginning there is no key established what at, uh, at all. Later on in Diane au Bois, you get the resolution of the C-sharp that we've had subverted in a love duet. And that happens um, at the end of the piece. Just trying to find the reference to the thing. This is the beginning of the love duet where finally it comes back In this case, it comes back using the C sharp as the beginning as an enharmonic, that is D flat, uh, dominant of a resolution in G flat. What happens in the prelude à la primédie d'un faune is one thing more subtle, where the C sharp from the beginning actually turns into the big tune on the strings, which is in a D flat major. But you have this idea also, I think, of a rather innovative music at the beginning turning into a rather conventional music at the end. This music could possibly be Gounod or Massenet or something more traditional. And similarly, in the Prelude de la Primitie d'un Faune, when the big tune comes in on the strings, it's not quite as sugary as Gounod or, or, or Massenet, it's, it's more developed. But you essentially have the same idea of making the form of a piece driven by using a sub subverted or masked or denied uh, key signal at the beginning, which ends up um, uh, at the end uh, somehow 
uh, fulfilled. And I think this is one of the ways in which Diane comes back to that uh, comment that I made at the beginning about how pieces from the beginning of his, his youthful period actually provide him with materials to develop into some of his more important and greater pieces uh, later on. Well, we could also find elements in Pelias and Melisande, but by then we've become more involved with motives, and as we saw yesterday, with the juxtaposition of completely different musical languages. Tonality juxtaposed with, with the whole tone scale sections, with modality, all switching from one to the other. He'd progressed a lot. But I find that there are even elements in Diane au Bois, in the scenario, as well as in the music, which he carries forward into these later, more um, mature pieces. Thank you very much. <laughs> For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.